What's up everybody, Captain Cody Davis back again for another short video here. And today we're going to be talking about a technique that a lot of you didn't even know that I used, uh, a type of trip that a lot of you didn't even know that I offer. And then a lot of times once you find out I do, I get messages down the road asking about this particular technique. Uh, maybe you wanna take a loved one fishing or just try it out for yourself or whatever the case is. Today we're going to be talking about fishing with wild shiners on Lake Okeechobee, or really just anywhere throughout Florida. Uh, so I'm gonna just go out on a limb and say most of you that watch my channel are primarily tournament anglers, whether you're fishing the bigger tournaments or you're fishing small club events, it doesn't matter. Or maybe you're not a tournament angler at all, but you know, you go out there every weekend and uh, you know, you're strictly artificial, right? Um, as am I. But a lot of you, you know, see these shiner guides that exclusively shiner fish. And then when we're on our trips, you know, they, I always get asked, do you offer shiner trips? And of course I do, especially in the winter time. Um, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's the best way to catch a real big one. And I thoroughly enjoy it. Um, now, when I have a day off, do I go out and shiner fish myself? Most of the time, no, but there's no denying that it's a blast, especially if you've got kids on the boat, um, you have a first time angler, or, you know, maybe you're, I have a lot of people that book me that are big time tournament anglers all over the country, but come down here to take advantage of the shiner fishing on Lake Okeechobee every winter, because at the end of the day, it's a blast. It's so fun. So a lot of you will ask me about it. And then maybe it'll be, you know, like I said, a couple months down the road, I'll get a message like, Hey, I've never shiner fished before, but I have a relative coming in. How do I set up? How do I rig? What's the best way to do it? And I've been getting a lot of messages about it as of late. So I figured I would just do a video about how I do it, how I set up my rig and kind of how I go about doing it. So we'll get into it. So for whatever reason, when you're talking about shiner fishing, a lot of people think you just throw the shiner out there and eight, nine pounders are just gonna fall on the hook. And that's not the case. You know, shiner fishing is, at the end of the day, it, it is difficult. It's totally different um, than artificial fishing, meaning that you're kind of looking for a different setup and there's different things that I'm looking for when it comes to a shiner trip than an artificial trip. You know, I make the joke that it, it is actually more difficult for me if I run five artificial trips in a row and then on the sixth day I have a shiner trip because you're typically fishing a completely different area for the most part. Sometimes they coincide together, but there's just, I don't know, I don't know how to explain it, but basically, I mean, you're sitting and waiting on fish to come to you, shiner fishing, whereas with artificials, you're kind of you know, meandering around trying to hit individual fish in the face. So first things first, you know, the time of year is crucial. I, I really like fishing shiners in the winter time. Believe it or not, and you can ask a lot of the other shiner guides or a lot of other guides that offer shiner trips out here, they don't always just eat golden shiners. Um, you know, in the summertime, it's very difficult for me at least. Um, I struggle with, you know, catching fish on shiners. I'm not sure what the case is or why you would think if you find a school of fish, you could throw a shiner in there and they'll eat it. And that's not often the case. I'm not sure what the difference is or what the case is with it, but I prim primarily do better in the winter time. And it might be because of the, uh, the environment that are the areas that I like to fish with shiners kind of excel in the winter time. So what I'm really looking for for a good shiner area is a highly trafficked spot. And I don't mean by boats, I mean by fish. You wanna look for an area that's maybe out in front of a key spawning area. That's one thing I'm always looking for, which you're always gonna look for that when you're artificial fishing also, but I want a place or a spot that's more like a highway that fish are using to come in, spawn, and come out. That way you're catching them staging, you're catching them on their way into spawn, you're catching them on your way out to spawn. So whether that's like a boat lane, or maybe you're fishing a big open pocket and a big reed head dead in the middle of it. If it has any blown in cover, as in chopped eelgrass, water hyacinth, pennywort, uh, if there's high driller around, that's all just, that's, that's very key to me. Um, and it's definitely a bonus. I like there to be a canopy. I like there to be a little roof and some cover for these fish to get under. Uh, because a lot of times here in the winter, we're dealing with those high pressure situations. It's not gonna be overcast, it's gonna be bright and sunny. And I really feel like those fish and specifically those bigger fish like to get tucked up underneath something. Now, another thing I like to do 
is I always like to fish the windblown side of whatever it is I'm fishing. So if I'm fishing, say, a reed head out in the middle of open water with some pennywort or some water hyacinth blown up in it, and the wind is, I want the wind hitting me at my back, pushing directly as I'm looking and my lines are to the reed head for a couple reasons. One, that's how these bass are going to set up. If they're tucked up under that reed head, but that wind starts blowing on the reed or on the, on the grass or just on the lake in general, and it starts creating that current, those fish are going to tend to poke their noses out into the current and wait for bait to get washed to them. So you want that shiner to be drifting or be on the wind blown side. Um, and then another thing it's going to do is it's going to eliminate a lot of tangles also, especially if you're throwing more than one line out there. Uh, clean water is, you know, obviously is, is, is somewhat key, but you can catch them on the dirt, you know, in some dirtier water. So definitely keep an eye out. You know, if you see something that looks good and it might be out more towards the main lake, but maybe it's a, a boat trail that you catch a lot of fish on throwing plastics or throwing rattle traps or vibrating jigs on and the other times, that's a highway you know these bass use um these boat lanes just like a deer uses their trail um, and, and it's funny i'm not a deer hunter but i compare shiner fishing to deer hunting a lot because you're setting up you want places where they're frequent you know they're they're frequently you know moving on and you got to wait for them to come to you um, now a lot of people say man i don't know how long i'm supposed to stay in an area before i leave it's it, it's it, every situation is different. You know, there are days where or times where I know I'm in a good area. I know I'm in a spot where these big fish, these big wolf packs and big females are moving in and out of or coming into frequently. And I have to explain to my customers, listen, um, this isn't going to be fast and furious. It might, we might go 30 minutes without a bite, but then in five minutes, we'll catch 15 fish and they'll all be over four and a half, five pounds. And that's a very common thing waiting for these packs of fish to move in. Again, I, a lot of these tips I give you guys are much easier for me to follow because I'm on the lake every day. I have the confidence, I have the momentum going in. If you're a first timer, I mean, you know, or you're not, you're not used to the shiner thing, um, at the end of the day, if it makes sense and it looks good to you originally, like if you have enough confidence to lay your boat down, put your power poles, your anchor down, set the shiners up and throw them out in this area, it's probably a good area. You might just have to wait longer than you would think. A lot of people, like I said before, a lot of people think the shiner hits the water and you're on. That is not the case all the time. It can be, but it's not the case all the time. So um, look for what looks, you know, fish what's, what you're confident in, what looks good to you, set up and wait. Um, you know, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll throw a rod out or two, depending on how many people I have on the boat. And uh, you know, if and I'll let those sit. If we start getting bit, I might throw out an extra rod or two for some people. Now, here's my tip for you. Let's just say there's three of you on the boat. I typically recommend fishing one rod per person because if you're flatlining these shiners on corks, even though you're throwing them with the wind, sometimes if they're bigger baits, they will tend to kind of want to swim. And that's it around, and you want to let the shiners do that. Um, and we'll get into that more here in a minute. The more lines you have out, the more tangles. And then obviously if you hook a big fish, you're gonna run the risk of getting tangled up. So I usually try to keep one rod in my angler's hands and then I might throw a spare out the back or somewhere completely out of the way just to try it. So um, yeah, with the water coming up on the lake right now, um, you know, if the shiner fishing is going to be good, you're gonna be able to get in these backwater areas and, and soak these baits. So. It's a great time, um, and I do offer the trips. If you guys are looking to go do it, obviously let me know, and we can definitely make that happen. Between now and March are the best times, early March. But um, and this goes for you know the, the the kind of the techniques and the rigs I'm going to talk about. Primarily, I mean they they work all throughout Florida. Um, you know I, I keep saying Lake Okeechobee because that's where I make my living, but Headwaters Lake, Kissimmee, Toho, Harris Chain. All of these, anywhere in Florida, you know, we are known for our wild china fishing and it's a great time. So um, that's about it. I'm gonna get into kind of the rigs that I use. So china fishing is one of the few techniques that I will use a spinning rod for exclusively out here on Okeechobee. Couple reasons. One, when you're shiner fishing, 
It's not like you're throwing a big easy or a swim jig and you're throwing it in the thick stuff and bringing it through it. Typically, you're keeping your bait on the edge of the grass line, whether it's Kissimmee grass, whether it's a mat, cattail head. Uh, now, if you do hook a big one, he is going to try and run you in there, but I still like using the spinning rods for a couple reasons. One, it's more fun for the anglers most of the time. You know, if it's lighter tackle, the fish are gonna fight a little better, for one. Two, like I just mentioned, your bait's typically on the edge of the grass line, so you don't, once you kind of get them out of that first foot of grass, you're usually in the clear. Secondly, um, you never know if you go out and buy five dozen shiners, you know, you might scoop in the well and one of them might be legit seven inches long. And then the next one you scoop might be three inches long, right? With these spinning rods, you could throw a smaller bait a lot further, a lot more accurate. And you're fishing lighter line more comfortably. So like I'll usually fish like 15 or 20 pound braid. Um, but what that also does, it doesn't catch as much wind. You know, if your power pulled down or anchored and have your shiner sitting like this and the wind's kind of hitting you, you know, maybe it's not hitting you directly in the back. Maybe it's hitting you a little bit to the southeast or so. Your line's going to get a big bow in it, and it's actually going to pull your shiner a certain direction, which a lot of times you won't want. If you have a thinner diameter line, you're not the wind and the current isn't going to affect it as much. So usually like 15 to 20 pound braid, you can use 30, you can use 50, you can use whatever you want. But I'll use a 20 pound braid and I attach a leader. Now, you don't have to. A lot of you can fish straight braid for this technique. I feel like using some 17 or 20 pound fluoro or mono gets me a couple more bites and it's more abrasion resistant. So when you're dealing with sometimes catching 30 to 40 fish in a row, um, this thin braid it takes a lot more abuse than say mono does. You know, with it, with the thin braid not having any stretch, if that braid rubs on that sandpaper mouth enough, um, you know, it's gonna get frayed, it's gonna get weak, and obviously it has no stretch. So any impact is gonna go straight to the weakest link on the braid, which at the end of the day, you're gonna break off more, which means I have to retie more. I don't wanna be retying. I want my customers to have their line in the water and be fishing as much as possible. So a mono or floral leader helps me not retie as much. And, uh, you know, contrary to what people tell you, fluorocarbon does have a little bit of stretch, but I think this is even 20 pound mono. So even if it gets a little frayed up and beat up, you, you're not gonna break off nearly as much, but I still, it is important to retie, but uh, you know, it is what it is. Uh, so with this particular rig, this is as simple as it gets. This is just 15 pound braid, might be 20, I don't remember. A double uni knot, Splice just a piece of 20 pound or 17 pound mono. I don't remember what this is. A cork that's just, you know, pegged in place. And this is a three aught kale hook. So this is the hook I use. My, if you were to pick one size to fit all, I usually use a four aught. That's my, that's my go-to. This is a three because we were using domestic shiners the other day. They were a little bit smaller. So I put a three aught on there. You guys can see it there. It's your typical, it's called a kale hook, but a shiner hook, most people call them. And what's great about these is you can hook the fit, the, the bait. We'll just use this Savage Gear mullet here. It's gold, like a shiner. You could take this hook, and if I was fishing a bait this big, I would definitely be using the four aught, if not the five aught. But you can hook the shiner in the tail like this. I'll usually go back, there's a, you know, they got the little dorsal fin more towards the tail and hook them like this. The thing with this is, which is neat, is they're gonna tend to swim more because they're gonna feel that resistance of that cork behind them and they wanna swim away from it. All right, so they're gonna be a little bit more active if you hook them in the tail. Um, they're also gonna throw better because their head weighs the most so that you have that head weight going with the wind. So you're gonna be able to throw this further. The downside is one, you'll throw them off more. If you throw it too hard, they will rip out easier. Uh, and another thing is, uh, you know, everyone says bass eat their bait head first. They swallow it head first. They're gonna grab it however they can. But what'll happen a lot of times with these shiners is they'll eat it, pull it under, and you'll feed, they'll actually start to kind of spin the shiner around in their mouth. Um, and while they're doing that, might be when you set the hook, and this is going to rip out of your bait much easier being in the tail, which is good for a hookup ratio, right? Um, you're gonna probably hook more fish but if you end up pulling, let's just say the, the fish doesn't have the bait that well at the time you get tight. 
A lot of times you'll just air ball. It'll just come out, you won't feel anything. Whereas if you hook them in the nose like this, what I do is I go through the chin, out the top left nostril, just like that. If the fish hits it and you pull and it doesn't hook them, this just looks natural like it got away from them. You're pulling it from the front and it will just kind of kick out of their mouth. Nine times out of 10, the fish is gonna come back and get it. So if they pull it and miss it, and I see that shiner skip up on top, I'll tell my customers, open the bay and let it sit there, and they'll come back and grab it a lot of times. Um, this, you know, I, I switch it up. I'll hook them in the tail, I'll hook them in the nose, just like this. Um, a lot of times it doesn't matter, but like I said, they are, they tend to be more active hooked in the tail, but this is nice because the hook stays in there much better through the cast, and if you were to miss a fish or something like that. Um, the distance from your cork doesn't really matter. I usually do about two foot, 18 inches or so. And uh, here's the deal. This is the best way, in my opinion, to fish a wild shiner. Be for the simple fact that if you're fishing for big bass, they're smart, okay? They're, they're not dumb. If a nine pounder swims up to a shiner this size, and we do use shiners the size of this swim bait here, um, well, hold on, I'm jumping the gun here. I'll get, I'll get into this in a second. So that's the cork. And then basically what I do is, you know, in that case, I'll let the wind naturally blow that cork or that bait up to the mat or up to the reed head. And then it's up to my customers to kind of keep them on the edge. You do want that shiner to kind of swim up underneath that mat a little bit. That's gonna entice that fish to get them. And if they do kind of swim up and get a little wrapped in the vines and stuff, a big fish is just gonna suck them right out of it anyway. So you wanna keep them there. Um, and then a lot of times what this cork will do, it'll butt up against that mat and it'll kind of prevent that shiner from going way up underneath there, which is what you want. So don't be afraid to let that cork blow up and get in the thick stuff. Uh, the biggest thing with this technique is throw it out and leave it. Everyone wants to reel their shiner in after a 60 seconds of sitting out there. You throw it out and don't move it. Let the bait soak, let it sit there. You're gonna bring them in, re-throw them, you're gonna kill the bait. That bait might be stationary underneath those reeds. They might be a little bit tangled up, but he's sitting there natural, upright, breathing, you know, through his gills, he's acting normal. And then when a big fish comes up and tries to get him, he's gonna try and kick and he's gonna get eaten. Let him sit there, especially if he's in a good area. Nine times out of 10, your bait is still on the hook. Let it, let it chill out. Um, and I'll kind of get into my other rig here. This is one that most of the other guides use exclusively, but I'll get into why I like the flat line more here in a minute. But basically it's a drop shot. So same outfit, 15, 20 pound braid, 20, 17 pound leader. And what I've got here is I've got a drop shot weight. I've got about a foot and a half of line and I do basically like a blood knot to put a leader off the side. You can do it however you want to do it. You could even use a three-way swivel. All right, I've got about eight to 10 inches of line coming off. I've got my same kale hook here. And then what we've got is I've got this cork with the line going through the peg so it can slide. All right, now what I messed up doing on this one is I did not put a bobber stop on. So what I'll do is I'll measure my bobber stop so that when this weight is on the bottom, that this cork will float and be about, you know, when it's floating and everything's straight up and down, that my cork is about, oh, six inches from the stop. That way when the fish hits it, he doesn't feel that resistance from the cork right away. The fish will pull, it'll hit that, and then the cork will go under. See what I'm saying? But this picture is a bobber stop here. The benefit to this is that you can throw into the wind, right? So let's just say we're fishing this way up against a reed head, but maybe there's some hydrilla or submerged hydrilla or some pepper grass or something growing out behind me. If I have two anglers fishing flat lines here, I could take this weighted rig and throw it into the wind. It's got a weight, so it's gonna throw really nice. And I could put it in the wind and the weight's going to keep it stationary there. Um, also, maybe if we're fishing some really thick stuff, or we're fishing some Kissimmee grass on the outside line. Kissimmee grass is a pain to shiner fish in because those shiners will wrap around and tie knots around the stalks. This prevents them from doing that because it keeps them in one spot. They don't have much freedom you know, to swim. This is like a half ounce weight. You could use a three quarter, but a shiner is not a very tough fish. You don't have to use a very heavy weight. He's not gonna move that, you know, that weight very much. Um, 
So this keeps your shiners in one spot, which is nice. Maybe if you have anglers that are in as advanced, maybe you have kids on the boat. This is a nice way to do it because, you know, you can kind of just leave the rod locked up. Don't, you don't have to let them swim anywhere because they ain't going to. And you could literally put it right in the spot. You can cast it right up to the grass line and bloop, it's there. Now, the downside to this technique for me, I'm gonna get a lot of criticism for this because there's a lot of shiner guys out here that have been doing this way longer than me and catch a lot of giant fish. But to me, when a big bass swims up to a bait fish, whether it's a bluegill, a shiner, or a shad, the bait fish is supposed to get the hell out of there. He doesn't want to be there. And to me, what I've noticed is I catch more big fish on the free line, like I showed you before, but you can't, that's not always the best, depending on where you're fishing. If a nine pounder swims up to a shiner right here and he's trying to kick off, but that weight's holding him in place and he's kicking but not going anywhere, that's not very natural looking to me. Um, and I feel like that prevents some of the big bites that we get. There's a lot of times where I'll have a shiner soaking on this rig and that cork will start moving, that line's jumping and nothing ever happens. And I feel like a lot of times those big, those real big, smart, educated fish will swim up to this rig and leave it alone. Now, I got my teeth kicked in by a lot of people fishing this rig last year, catching some giants. So it's a big confidence thing. I have caught some big ones on it, but at the end of the day, I feel like I catch bigger fish on the flat, the free line rig with the cork. Another thing that enables that bait to do is that shiner will get nervous and get up on top and it looks natural, it looks injured um, with the flat line rig and those big ones will just flush the toilet on it, which gets the bite, it's a cat and mouse thing, right? It's the, it's the, the bait trying to flee away that gets the reaction bite and selfishly, it's awesome to watch when those seven, eight pounders just crush the shiner on top under a mat. Both rigs, when you get bit, what I tell people to do, you always wanna have some slack in your line for a couple reasons, especially with the flat line. One, if that big fish comes after that shiner, sometimes those shiners will get chased 40 feet. I mean, scooting on top and you just see the head weight behind them. And you want that. You don't wanna stop them in his place. That's unnatural. You want that shiner to get it. So I always tell people, keep it in free spool. That way, A, if he gets nervous and starts cutting a trail, you can let him run. Or B, if that fish just hits it, goes 20 mile an hour, he doesn't tight line you and you pull the bait out of his mouth. He's not gonna spit it out, it's a live bait. You know, when it goes under, you don't have to let him swallow the bait. When it goes under, close the bail, point the rod tip where you last saw the cork floating, reel, and when it get, point it right at it, and when it gets tight, you don't yank with this technique. Just pull into them, just like a drop shot. These kale hooks are basically a mix between a J and a circle hook. They work great. Um, a lot of people say they gut hook fish with them. That's if you let them swim to China and back. Like I said, if it goes under, he's got it. Point it at him, reel it. You don't have to reel 100 mile an hour. Nice controlled, you know, speed. Rod tip pointed down. As soon as it gets tight, just a hard lean back. And nine times out of 10, they're gonna be hooked right in the corner of the mouth. Pop the hook out, take your pictures, let them go, put another bait on there and you're off to the races. So that's about it. Um, it's, you know, people, people like downplay shiner fishing. It's a blast. You can catch some big ones. You catch good numbers when you find the right area. And um, it's fun. And what something else it does is it lets you know how many fish are in that given area. Like you might go through an area the day before, I might, I might be fun fishing, catch some fish. But God, there's a good group of fish in here. And then you go back the next day and you go through nine dozen shiners in four hours. There's so many fish in this lake and this is what allows you to see what's really living there when they're, when they're on the shiners. So if you guys wanna book a trip to go do this, if you've never done it, uh, let me know. I'll be 100% honest with you. I'm, I'm pretty much booked up uh, through the rest of this month. Actually, tomorrow afternoon, me and Breezy are hitting the road. We're going to be going to the Georgia property for two days. Um, she's going to try and kill a big deer she has on camera. And uh, then we're leaving there Monday morning, and we're driving to Bryson City, North Carolina. We're going to just got a week, a getaway, me, her, and Lake, going to hang out in a cabin on a river in the mountains, enjoy some cold weather, and just relax for four days or for a week. Looking forward to it. I am gonna bring the camera stuff. So, well, I had it all put away, but 
I'm gonna be doing some trout fishing, just fishing in some streams. I'm a Florida boy. If I see flowing water, natural flowing water that folds over a river rock and gets white and it's cold water, I literally slam the truck in park and get out and walk around in it. I just, I, I love it. We don't have creeks, we don't have rivers down here. And um, it's gorgeous up there this time of year. The leaves are gonna be changing. And uh, I'm excited to just put some waders on, walk around the stream with some two pound test um, and catch some rainbows, hopefully a brook trout uh, and uh, you know throw the fly around a little bit and just, so I'm gonna video it. So if you guys wanna watch a complete, you know, clueless idiot when it comes to trout fishing, try to catch some trout. That'll probably be the next video. Um, I have been looking forward to this trip for, since we booked it last year, um, just, just a, a week to get away and just relax before season really, really kicks off. When I get home, um, I'm booked through the remainder of the month. November really starts to shiner fishing. You know, it, we're gonna start really getting some cold weather by then. So if you guys wanna do some shiner fishing, let me know. Uh, call and get your deposits in and I, we can book a trip to go do that. But besides that, I'm going to finish packing to get ready to go. I work tomorrow, and then uh, as soon as I get off the lake, we are hitting the road. So your next video you'll see, hopefully, will either be, it's going to be a lot of ultralight fishing. You know, it might be breezy shooting a big deer. It might be me catching giant bluegill in the pond in Georgia. Or it's going to be me trampling through the North Carolina mountains trying to catch some wild trout. We'll see. But I appreciate you guys watching. I know this video well, this video was almost a half an hour long. I talk way more than I thought. But uh, it's a great technique. Go use it. I hope this works or helps you guys out. If you have any questions regarding shiner fishing, um, shoot me a text or leave a comment below. And, uh, you know, I'll be sitting in a hot tub this week watching a river drinking a beer. So I'll play on my phone and answer back. So, uh, you know, like and subscribe, and uh, I appreciate all of you guys watching and following along with my crazy little YouTube channel here. So I'll see you guys on the next one. Be safe out there and uh, tight lines.